Yeah. Yep. Um, so hi again, uh, my name is Andre, welcome to the Surge Society Lectures. Um, today we have uh, Nikhil Sapre, he's an advanced trainee in urology, and he'll be talking to us about the management of urological issues. Again, if you have any problems streaming online, just let us know. Um, comments on the YouTube page, thank you. Thanks, Phil. Thanks, Phil. Um, I'm Nikhil, I'm one of the urology trainees at Royal Melbourne. Um, thanks for having me along, it's, um, it's good fun. I actually um, am involved in setting up Surgical Society in my medical school about 10 years ago, so it's nice to come back and talk to people. I, know I was on the course, like inviting people to give lectures for me, which is you know, hard work sometimes. So. Um, um, I was just going to make it, I don't have any, oh, I haven't got slides, I think I was just trying to make this as interactive as possible, you know, when I was in medical school, I would just sit and listen to people and forget about it in two days, and the only thing I remember was when, you know, people were interactive and they involved students, and, you know, that's the only way that's their way, so I thought, we'll make it a bit interactive, we can, I'll ask you questions, you guys can answer stuff, and um, feel free to be just very casual, interrupt me, you can ask any questions, no problem. Okay, it's not, it's not going to be that epic session, it's just going to be practical session, you know, example, for you being an ED, seeing a patient, what are you going to do type of thing? Okay, um, I'll cover, you know, whatever we can, we'll go for 45 minutes or so. I'll try and cover the first thing is um, um, urinary tract calculus, which so is something you'll see very commonly. Um, if you're working in ED and have a urological issue, <clears throat> then we'll talk a little bit about LUTs in males. Again, that's something you know you will see very commonly. Maybe not in ED, but if you're in the community setting in general practice, just think about urine retention, which you'll see all the time in uh, many different rotations you do. And then if you have time, we'll speak a little bit about, speak a little bit about hematuria as well. Okay, so those the three are probably you know sort of bread and butter of uh, general urology. Uh, okay, and I'll try and keep it pretty practical. I'm not going to go into like really detailed academic stuff which you can know and read. I'll try and keep it sort of practical. Okay, um, so we'll start off with just talking a little bit about kidney stones. Okay, um, so say you have your ED, you know, Friday night, you have a patient come in, 32 year old chap, is coming with um, left sided flank pain. You know, um, you know, how do you, what, what kind of pain would you expect, say, you know, think about renal you know, calculi, what kind of pain would you expect in someone with, who's presenting with ureteric stones? How would, you, how would you distinguish it from, say, say he has right, right sort of right side of flying pain, how would you distinguish it from other surgical causes like appendicitis or diverticulitis, if it's on that side? How is it different? Sure, so I think a couple of things, one maybe, I'm targeting more where exactly it is, so the sign, it's more on the flank behind, potentially, as opposed to, say, a yep. biliary cause in the right upper quadrant. And then maybe then the second thing would be the type or um, quality of it. So is it is, uh, green or colic, which is actually true colic, or is it more constant pain? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the nature is different, as in people with appendicitis, diverticulitis, they want to sit still. You know, they're most comfortable when they're lying still. If they move, they get pain. People who don't click can't get comfortable. They're always moving around. Um, you know, um, so that, that's, that's one thing that really differentiates people from bowel causes, like appendicitis from real colic. Um, <clears throat> and you can get pain anyway. So if you know, stones can be anywhere in the ureter, generally non-obstructive kidney stones don't cause a lot of pain. They can, but generally don't. Uh, what causes pain is when stones drop into the ureter. <clears throat> So the urine is about four millimeters wide. Anything more than that is going to cause obstruction with urine trying to pass um, and increase pressure in the renal pellets. Um, so proximal stones can cause pain, you know, kidney area, left flank, left flank. As they come down, you know, you can get radiating classically the described as loin to groin pain, okay, from the flank down to the groin. And if you get distal ureteric stones, um, you can actually get pain sort of in the inguinal area, even the testes. So someone, you know, <clears throat> I've had people present with uh, testicular pain, you know, they'll call me saying, oh, this guy has torsion, and, um, you know, testes were normal, but it was referred frame from a little small distal uterus stone. So always keep that in mind. Um, pain can differ uh, based on where the location of the stone is. Um, <clears throat> what, are, what, are, what else can happen with the kind of pain? What are the symptoms um, can you have? It's a renal college, you generally don't have signs of peritonism like the guarding and the. Yeah. But that's, that's an exam. Like, what about in history? history. What else might they tell you? Um, 
so kind of quite an acute onset. Um, I guess we were talking about timing. It's really severe as well. Yeah. So other than the pain, any of the symptoms you can get. Uh, so you might get hematuria. Yeah. They really might tell the guy some blood in the urine. Yeah. That that's not everybody will, but often they can. Yeah. Um, uh, anything else? Yeah. So they can get an infection as well. Some people present with simple stuns. Can present with infection as well. I mean, people who have a infection on top of an obstructed uh, ureter from a stone can be very very sick. Um, okay, so they'll present with you know anywhere from just fever and being relatively well to full blown septic shock requiring ICU. Um, but yeah, all right. So immature infection, infective symptoms, fever and pain. It's the sort of classic um, classic things you can get. So say this, this guy's not come in, right, right flame pain, ready to go into groin. Um, what you know, you examine him. He's got no peritonism, as you described. It's not something you typically get with renal stones. Um, what investigations do you think? Oh, this guy could have you know, kidney stone. What investigations are you going to do? Um, you could. Um, Simple as that, sorry. Are you going to go in? Okay, I think you're going to use someone who have all What are simple things you can do first? X ray? You could do an X ray, yes. So, so right. let's start with, you know, so we can tame it up as, you know, um, simple biochemical tests. We can do like bloods and urine and stuff, and then this imaging stuff. So if you leave aside imaging, what about simple stuff? Well, that's what, what, what Probably start with the urinalysis. Yeah, main thing. absolutely. Even just a gypsy. Yeah, absolutely. And what would you classically see in someone? You'd be looking for hematuria. Say something don't have infection. Is yeah. coming with pain. You're looking for non-glomerular um, red yeah. blood cells. Yeah. So blood in the urine is very common. Okay. In fact, ninety something percent of people with stones will have blood in the urine. In fact, that's one of the main things. If you if you're not quite sure if this is renal colic or something else. Do a urine dipstick. You'll often find most people with stones will have some trace blood, at least my, at least microscopic sure. Okay, so that's that's a simple thing you can do. Anything else? Urethra, check the renal function. <laughs> yep, absolutely. So check the renal function as well, of course. Um, and of course, if you're going to do bloods, you do an MP, and, you know, uh, really. But that's looking for signs of infection. All right, so. Uh, if, you, if you suspect they have a fever, then you want to check the CRP, check their white cell count. Yeah. Um, okay. Is there a for microscopy of the urine Um, Not really, but it's not going to change your management. Often, you know, you don't often see crystals in the urine, even if you have uric acid stones. You don't classically see, so you just see crystals in the urine, like, you know, in the gout, if you ask for it, you'll see crystals, not like that. Okay. Um, um, often, what you, the most common thing is just blood in the urine. Okay, and you can send it off for a formal culture, especially if you think they have an infection. Uh, I always send it off for a formal culture, but generally, if they don't have an infection, I'll just come back at this microscopic temperature. So, dipstick, send it off for culture, you do bloods, FB, use and A's, uh, and what imaging are you going to do to confirm your diagnosis? What is the most sensitive imaging test to pick up? <laughs> yeah, exactly. CTKUB. So you don't need CTKUB is basically a non contrast CT, and KUB is in the kidney or bladder, so they take everything from the kidneys down all the way to the bladder. Um, and so you don't need contrast, okay? It's a non contrast CT, it's an oral IV contrast, and that's enough to pick up stones. And um, generally, you will see a, a dense stone, pure white on a non contrast CT. Um, and yeah, and what are the things you want to know in a CT scan? You know, what are the things you're looking at when you have, so starting from the kidney down to the bladder, if you're looking at a CT scan, what, what are you going to look at? I think Yeah, so yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's one thing you can, and almost everyone, a lot of people with obstructive stones will have hydronephrosis, yes. So you want to look at how many stones there are. Um, where they are, so is it in the kidney only, is it in the ureter, is it, you know, proximal ureter, mid ureter, distal ureter. Um, you want to look at, you know, if you suspect signs of infection, you can look at their kidneys, if they have any peridifferent stranding. Often you'll see that the contour of the kidney, the, the fat around it will, um, you get significant stranding around that, which is, you know, potential sign of infection. Um, 
the other thing is always look at the contralateral kidney. Okay, very important. You don't want to miss, you know, a stone in both ureters. Uh, it's potentially uh, bad. Thing, okay, so always look at the contralateral kidney. Is it clear? Is it functioning? You know, it's is there anything in the ureter obstructing? Yeah, you can easily miss something like that, which you don't want to. Um, so that's the imaging. Um, any other things in bloods you would do that probably wouldn't affect your management immediately, but something you'd want to get? Um, like a CMP, looking for maybe, yeah. you know, if it's a secondary course from hypercalcemia. You know, like yeah, that's right. So generally, a simple biochemical analysis and everyone is you should do a calcium phosphate, serum uric acid. Yeah, it's very, very basic. Um, and I think everyone with, who presents to a hospital with, with urethrin capsule should get should get. Okay. Doesn't have to be when they come in. Could be before you discharge them back after all their management, they should have they should have the collection checked. Okay. Um, you can do PTH as well, but I mean the yield is pretty low. Okay. Um, but yeah, CMP uric acid. Um, 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 all right, so, so with the um, CMP, was that just to look for composition of stones? Yeah, so you want to rule out if someone has a big parathyroid adenoma um, that's causing hypercalcemia, you don't want to miss that. Okay, um, or you know, there's lots of metabolic causes of stones, and I won't go into all of them now because some of it can get pretty academic, and you guys can easily go look up in a book. I won't keep it pretty practical today, but definitely. Um, yeah, you want to rule out any metabolic causes, anything. And it's simple test takes inexpensive, it's simple, you can get it straight away. So always do it. Okay. Um, just quickly, is yeah. regarding imaging, is there any role for anything other than a CT KUB? Like yeah. just to no, that, that, that's, that, that's what I was gonna come to. So once you so ultrasound is not sensitive at all for picking up stones. If we have like kids, you know, like in the pediatric setting, and of course, I don't, I'm not going to go into all that stuff now because it's pretty specific. Then it's okay, uh, but you know, you're not giving contrast. Anyone with renal failure, anyone can have a non-contrast CT essentially. Um, so ultrasound can show you maybe some hydro, but it's not good at looking at the ureter. Ultrasound is pretty good at looking at the kidneys. Reasonably good at looking at the bladder if it's distended, but it doesn't tell you much about the ureter at all. Um, all right, so it's not a very sensitive test and something I don't order. You can sometimes use it for follow up, you know, just to see the stones passed, you know, the hydro is resolved. But if you look for the diagnosis, CTK is the gold standard. Okay. Now, uh, what you should get though, once you get a CT and that shows a stone, what is useful is an x ray. Because as I'll talk and do, you know, the management of stones, one of the management options can be medical explosive therapy, you don't actually treat surgically, uh, and you want to follow, uh, follow them up in a few weeks' time, if you get an x-ray uh, at the time of your diagnosis, you get approximately a stone, if you've seen an x-ray, then on a follow-up, you only have to do an x-ray. You don't have to do a repeat CT, you're saving them. You know? And often these people are young, you don't want them to keep you know, radiating them again and again. So if they've had an x-ray, it shows a opaque stone, then it's easy to just do a repeat x-ray, and if it's stone's cleared in the x-ray, then you know it's gone. Okay, is the scalp kind of CT enough? To yeah, it's not that great quality. I'd always get a formal X ray. And sometimes look at the lot of bowel gas and stuff, even that's, you know, it's hard to interpret, but always worth getting a plan. Always get a plan done, okay? And uh, once you've diagnosed a stone and a CT can be done. Um, right, so say you've got, you know, this 32 year old guy, it's coming rough, like playing pain, he's got a six millimeter stone on the proximal ureter, renal function is normal. Hasn't got any infection. Now, what, what, what are your, what are your indicators? How do you decide does this person need to come to the hospital, or um, can I send him home? So, what are you, what are the indications to admit a patient with your renal failure? If they have one kidney. Yes, so solitary kidney, and they're stored in the urine solitary kidney. Yes, absolutely. That's that thing. Well, yes, yeah. any sign of infection, absolutely. The sign of the stone, the cancer cell. Mm, not necessarily. Yes, yes, I, I agree. Yes, um, anything that's very big that you think is unlikely to pass, uh, you might not necessarily admit them, but you might decide this is not someone I'm going to treat conservatively. I'm going to offer them a definitive treatment for this stone. I'm not necessarily, if the pain is well settled, you're going to admit them, but it might have a effect, effect on what treatment you offer them, but not necessarily. Um, but yeah, that's, that's a good thought because that does affect treatment. 
aneurysm. Yeah, the aneurysm. And when would you get that kind of thing? In the um, so just give me one second, just gonna let my fellow panel. Okay. Hey, I'm just giving a lecture to the med students. Yeah. I'm just saying, yeah, 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 I'll put that. Yeah, so when would you get that? When you would you be in your aneurysm? Mm -hmm. So a single kidney, and you've got obstructed single kidney, or bilateral symptoms. Okay. So you're not going to get an aneurysm in a one completely normal kidney that's unobstructed, that is, that's functioning with. Okay, you're only going to get an aneurysm. The bilateral uric stones, or so these are all indications of sepsis, um, significant renal failure. And I'm talking about not just crap in a heart and 30 and 40, which can often happen when they have their nausea and vomiting, you might have fallen renal failure, um, sepsis, renal failure, um, um, single kidney obstructed bilateral uric stones, and obviously, if you can't get on top of the pain, okay, so if you uh, typically, if they come to morphine, they've got morphine. But if you're going to get top of the pain, obviously, they have to come in. You can't send someone with an IV pain and lose your one IV morphine. Okay? So, these are all the indications to admit patients. Most of the others can go on. Um, slide of the stone depends on what you would offer them, but doesn't always mean you have to admit someone with a slightly bigger stone. Um, all right, um, let's talk about infection since we're here. Um, Say this person, 6 mm approximately a prick stone, have a temperature of 38.5, looking at their own wells, sweaty, then a urine dipstick, and you know, there's blood, there's leukocytes, nitrites. Um, what are the options? How, and obviously, you've decided that that's a cute indication to admit somebody. What are you going to do for someone like that? Or are you going to manage a, what we call infected or obstructive kidney? Resuscitation. Yep. So always start with ABCs. That's the basis of any yeah, anything. Yeah. Antibiotics. Then you consider the nephrostomy to relieve the obstruction. Are they, is that the only thing you can do? Probably not. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> resus. So airway. You know, ABCs. Yeah. Fluids. Antibiotics. Um, um, and generally, you can give them something like ampicillin and gentamicin, or if they have renal impairment, you can give them ketrotrexin and uh, anamoxy or ampicillin. And they would generally, you want a good gram negative cover, and something like ampicillin will also cover enterococcus if you're giving them ketrotrexin, which, which, which uh, enterococcus is not covered by ketrotrexin. Um, yeah, so antibody fluids, and then urgent decompression, which could be in the form of uh, urethric stent in theater. Um, and I'll go how we do that, or a nephrostomy. Okay. So the nephrostomy is a tube, often, most, of the, most of the time is a radiologist doing them, and you basically put a tube in the kidney, you puncture the kidney and the ultrasound guidance in the radiology suite, um, and drain the urine directly from the kidney up into the tube. Okay. Um, or you can take it in the theater, um, or you can require a full general anesthetic and do a cystoscopy uh, and do a retrograde to the stem. Both of them, you know, I won't go into which is better than the others, but they're both valid options and depends on patient factors or other, you know, your local expertise factors on which one you would choose, but both are reasonable. Okay. So urgent recess, urgent decompression. Always put an IDC, um, you know, for urine output monitoring. Okay. They're very, very unwell, or I see you. If you think they're going to need something more than if they're not suitable to go to the wall. Um, for us, that's, that's the acute um, setting, you know, infection. What about other people? Say if someone doesn't have infection, they've got six million approximately of freaks down, um, still got some, you know, a little bit of pain, but it's settling, what, you know, um, they don't have any fundamental renal failure, two kidneys, it's done only on one side, so they don't have any acute indication necessarily for, for admission. What are the treatment options? For kidney stones, how can you treat your stones? So you can manage them conservatively, yep. pain, um, allergy disease, and allergy disease, and encourage them to hydrate themselves well, and hopefully the stone has passed. Yes. So what's that? It's basically medical expulsive. Oh, yeah. conservative management or medical expulsive therapy. Uh, so trial of passage, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, that's that's one option. Um, Lithotripsy. Yeah, and what kind of lithotripsy? Uh, ultrasound or um, 
searchable using a cystoscopy. Yeah, yeah. so on the ultrasound one, it's sort of ESWL, so extracorporeal shockwave with the trips, which is basically extracorporeal and from outside the body. Um, we don't do that in St. Melbourne, but Tom Bennett, St. Vincent's, and Monash uh, in Melbourne. Um, you can definitely do that. Um, so the ESW is two options. Uh, medical explosive therapy, um, you can do extracorporeal shock with the tripsy. You can do a retrograde renal surgery, so a ureteroscopy, uh, which again requires a full general anesthetic. You go in from the bladder uh, up, up into the ureter um, and um, use lasers. And there's various devices available to break up stones, lasers, and um, lithoclass, which is just like a jackhammer. Uh, but most of the times you use lasers now. Uh, to break it down. Um, um, and of course, then there is your big stone, you know, called PCNL or percutaneous nephrolithotomy. That's not something you would use to treat lower dissociative stones. It's basically a puncture in the kidney um, called percutaneous nephrolithotomy. You puncture the kidney and try and go directly onto the stone. Um, and you can use, again, with the class or, um, or lasers. Uh, to get the stone, but that's generally reserved for fairly large stones and in the kidney or in the sort of proximal ear. Okay, because you're puncturing the kidney, you, you don't want to puncture the kidney when your stones all the way down there near the bladder. Somewhere. So, how do you choose between these two depends on you know patient factors or stone factors. So, patient factors would be you know other comorbidities, you know other critical anesthetic. Um, what you know, all the kind of uh, all the things, stone factors, you know, size of the stone, where the stone is, distal, proximal, in the kidney, in the ureter, um, and again, I won't be going into full detail on you know all the indications and contraindications of each. You can look it up in, in a book, but generally, these are the most common ways to treat treat stone. Okay, if you think they have significant pain and they can't go home, but they don't have infection, their renal function is normal, um, then you can either admit them and do a ureteroscopy directly in hospital. Most hospitals don't have extracorporeal chocolate available as an emergency thing. It's very much an elective thing. So you've got to send them to St. Vincent's. Uh, but we do have emergency access to ureteroscopy or, or stenting. Uh, if they have significant um, pain and you don't have access to a ureteroscope or you know you can't do primary ureteroscopy, you can just put a stent in. At least it will treat their obstruction, it will get their pain under control, and you can come back in a few weeks' time and do their formal ureteroscopy. If you have access to ureteroscopy, you can go. If you can get up to the stone, you can laser the stone and put a stent in. At the end, okay. those are the sort of main options available to treat stones. <coughs> Um, um, so, what else? so we've gone up through the criteria for admission, um, who needs urgent management, we've gone through how to treat infection with stones, we've gone through the management options for stones. Um, so say you, the stone minimum is a 6 mm proximal ureteric stone, you admit, you know, they go home, you do the ureteroscopy and then they haven't passed. Um, the stone, you do a ureteroscopy and then, um, actually hang on a sec, I didn't really go through much on um, medical management and dissolution. There's a couple of things I missed out. Um, so you're talking about, you can see if they passed the stone, what, what, what would you put them on? So say pain is settling, there's not any, there's no indication for admission, they have no sepsis, their renal function is normal, they have two kidneys, working well, you said, oh well, your pain settled, you can go home. What would you send them home on and what sort of advice would you give the patient? When you are trying, um, just pack it on something. Yeah. But it's necessary. Mm -hmm. So let's drink plenty of water. And if the pain gets worse, or if it doesn't improve, or it gets worse, then you tell them to come back. To mm -hmm. Yeah, so always I send them on a regular panadol. And they say it's work really well every now and then. Doesn't matter, you know, you can use indomethacin, voltaren, but any NSAs work very well for renal So I'm sending them on regular panadol because it makes opiates work better. Regular NSAs, um, initially at least for the first couple of days, and then they can do a PRN, and then I send them on some endon PRN as well. Um, and then there is uh, tamsulosin, which is a uh, Alpha blocker. Uh, your your ureter is metabolic. Closing in five minutes if anyone wishes to borrow. 
Thank you. The uterus matter of um, smooth muscle, um, mainly alpha receptors, and tantalus and relaxes that. Okay, we'll see if it's often used in, in LUTs as well. Uh, but there is, it's controversial. There was a recent paper published that it's not actually very useful, but still, um, we've got data from many years, for, for many years of retrospective studies that it does actually um, increase your rate of stone passage. Okay, so I, I still would set them home on Tamsulos, although you should probably know that it's a bit controversial from some recent studies that have been done. Um, those are the main things, and I tell them, if you take all this and your pain is still not settling, come back. If you get an infection, if you get fevers, you feel like you have the flu, come back. Okay? So those are things you must tell them about. Okay? Um, yeah. The other thing you can do with stones um, is dissolution therapy. So there are some, and often we don't do them in the acute setting when people have urethric stones, a lot of pain, but often if you have non obstructing kidney stones, you can try dissolution. So some some form of stones. There's various different kinds of stones. You can have the most common kind of stones are calcium stones, calcium oxalate, which you can get uric acid stones, cysteine stones, infection stones like struvite stones, and some form of stones like uric acid is the most common one that forms an acidic urine. So you can dissolve them by alkalizing the urine. Okay. And the two most common things you can use, or at least we can practically use to alkalize urine, are um, uh, potassium chloride and sodium bicarbonate, sodium, okay. and they just come as tablets or sachets. Um, but, okay, so there's medical explosive therapy, pain management, alpha blockers, um, and you normally get the back to clinic in about four weeks' time with a repeat X-ray or CT dissolution, often for non obstructive stones, um, ESWL, retrograde renal surgery, the ureteroscopy, and laser or PCL for big kidney stones, okay. Um, so you've dealt, you've now dealt with this man's kidney stone, <coughs> taken the theater, done a uretroscopy, six millimeter stone, it's <coughs> pregnant into lasers, you put a stent in, which you've removed, uh, and he asks you, oh, doc, this is the first time I've had the stone, am I gonna get it again, and what can I do to prevent it from happening again? And that's practical advice you should give all patients um, before you discharge them. What would, what would you tell him? What could he do generally? Um, there is specific advice you can give based on exact stone type, but again, I won't go into all of that. Uh, but what generic advice would you give to him? Drink low fluids. Yep, absolutely. So the most common cause of stone is dehydration. So that's the number one. You drink a lot of fluids. How much? How much fluid should a person drink? Eight glasses. Yeah, yeah so that, that's great. Two liters. It, it's that's a reasonable guy. I get two years of water in there. Yeah. What else? Oh, you know, he's read somewhere that oh, you know, look, I read that the stones all all from calcium. So should I just stop eating calcium? Should I not eat any milk? I drink any milk and yogurt? Should I stop all of that? What would you say to that? Increase the rate of stones. Yeah, exactly. So it's actually the advice is you should have two. Two serves of dairy um, as, as a good, you know, um, to prevent renal stones. Because if you deprive the body of stones, the body's thinking there's no calcium coming through, and it actually increases the absorption of um, calcium. And it actually goes the other way around. You're actually more likely to get kidney stones. So tell them two serves of dairy a day is generally what's recommended for people with kidney stones. Anything else? Food. Any food? Yeah, what food? Well, yeah, or drinks like tea. If you drink a lot of tea, that of course like calcium oxalate stones come. Yeah, yeah. So things that are high in oxalate are you know there's there's many, but the common ones you know tea, dark chocolate, spinach, rhubarb, sort of the most commonly described ones. Okay. So tell them. So would you say they should never drink tea? Someone has a kidney stone. In moderation. Yeah, exactly. So I tell them if you have any of these things in excess reduce it to a moderate level, okay? Uh, <clears throat> anything else? Would we try and um, avoid acidifying the urine when we can? Uh, avoid, um, it's not specific things you can it's prevent acidification. Yeah, yeah. not sure of anything you can avoid from acidification, but <coughs> animal protein, especially red meat. Okay, again, doesn't mean you have to stop it. 
but reduce it to a, a moderate quantity. Okay. Now, so water, any of the oxalate containing things, tea, dark chocolate, spinach, rhubarb, animal protein, everything should be in moderation. Uh, two serves of barrier a day is considered good. Okay, but the main thing is water. That's the number one. Okay. Um, so that's that's stones. That's basic summary. Is there anything else? Do you think that was practical? Is there anything? Any other questions you have? Do you think that would cover most of the things that you would need to work in an ED as an intern or as a GP in the community? But that, that's really what I'm aiming to say. You know, not as you're going to be a urologist and you know. Um, any other questions? Um, how about the use of diuretics? If you know, already on a diuretic. Um, yeah. So they're, they're, they're specific, again, that, and then you go into, so people who have recurrent stones, then you should really do a, a very targeted biochemical <laughs> workout, which means they get more fancy blood tests in Europe. You do a 24 hour urine collection. There's lots of things you need to check for. Again, you probably should remember, you don't need to remember the top of your head, but just know that anyone with recurrent stones or high risk patients get a full extensive biochemical workout. Uh, and there are, and depending on the, uh, if, you, if you do a urethroscopy, you can send the stone up for analysis, see what kind of stone it is, um, and then you can give them targeted treatment based on the stone type. And one of them is, you know, diur diuretics and so on. And there's some evidence that they can, but it's not something you would do routinely at the first stone presentation. Okay? Uh, when you're going to give someone diuretics for prevention of stones, you really have to work them up biochemically properly, and generally a nephrologist or urologist will do that. Okay, probably won't have to do that in an emergency setting or don't practice it. Okay, because you're doing it really for the higher patients, not just someone who's got one off stone. That's it. So what's what's someone someone with the kidney stone and they tell them, what's the chance I'll get this again? Despite all the advice you give me, what's the chance I'll have this stone again any time in my life? You know, roughly what figure you could call it? One in three. Yeah, a bit more, more forty to fifty percent. They'll be able to get a stone sometime. Okay. Um, that's that's stones. I have a question about uh, yeah. renal ultrasound, like renal tract ultrasound. Yep. We wouldn't do them for stones, but when would the plants do like renal tract ultrasounds? I rarely order them for. Um, Definitely not in the diagnostic setting, I don't order them. Unless, again, in specific settings like, you know, pregnant women with suspected renal cannula, you, you don't want to do a CT. So, very special settings, you can, um, but generally not in the diagnostic setting. You could do them as a follow up. Um, so if someone has a dissolutic stone, they have hydronephrosis, they don't want to another repeat CT. You could do ultrasound in four weeks to see if the hydronephrosis has settled. You can't necessarily tell if the stone has passed, because often you can't see stones in ultrasound that well. But you could, you know, the hydronephrosis is resolved, the pain is resolved, they tell you they've passed the stone. Probably okay. Um, yeah. <coughs> um, so we'll probably move on to LUTs. Um, again, not something you'd see in ED, but um, probably something you should know about. You know, you'll see lots in the general medical wards and GP setting. Um, so again, let's say index case, 72 year old man comes to you, you're a GP, um, and he says, you know, I've been having a bit of trouble passing urine recently. You know, it's not quite what it used to be. Um, what sort of things are you going to look in history? Um, what, what do you want to know? So how are you going to, what, what sort of things are you going to look in history of this patient? You know? Look for or obstructive symptoms. Yeah, there's various different ways of classifying. Yeah, one is irritative obstructive. Probably the way I think about it more commonly is like storage or voiding. So is the problem with storing or is the problem with voiding? Um, and like with anything else, when you do your your history as a part of your OSCE, you need to have a very good review of systems in place. Okay, so what are the urological symptoms you should know? Ask them all. You know, just like someone coming with neurological problems, you go from headache, vision changes, out of numbness. You need to have a good neurological history. And what are the voiding symptoms and what are the um, storage symptoms? 
Um, storage so symptoms. Well, what are storage? Storage, so uh, frequency, urgency. Uh, pain, not urea. Yeah. Not urea. Pain is not so much a storage. Can be if you're on like retention and stuff, sure. But generally, urgency, frequency, not urea. Okay. So the storage symptoms which implies, you know, your bladder is going more, not able to store urine as well. What about avoiding symptoms? Difficult to initiate. Um, uh, weak, stream, <coughs> weak stream. Weak stream. Yeah. And uh, and stream dribbling. Yeah. Okay. So those are the things you should know. So they're always good to think about things that's classified. So avoiding symptoms, storage symptoms. Uh, you ask ask about them. Um, what else would you ask? The seventy-two-year-old man who's got low urine symptoms. You probably want to exclude an acute neurological cause. Like like a something in the spine, like a epidural abscess or. You know, sure. I mean, how many people are yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uncommon, but yeah, so say you're in the GP setting. Um, yeah, it's possible with any of that, that's the case. You know, it probably will be pretty evident if they have, uh, you know, sport chronic one syndrome, severe back pain. But before that, just simply stuff. Um, so you, you've got history presenting complaint. Obviously, you want to know about, you know, how long for is it deteriorating, and you know, what makes it come on. You want to find out about symptoms of retention, so have they got any pain. Uh, do they feel like they can't do the bladder well? Going next to that. Examination is also important for this. I'll get into that next. Um, you be concerned about hematuria. Yeah, hematuria. always. So that's again one thing you have to ask. Um, hematuria. And you can ask about incontinence. Often people who are in retention, you know, they don't have much pain, they're in chronic retention, they can get you know, incontinence from overflow. So ask about incontinence, how about hematuria? Yeah. Hematuria means that's a red flag. That straight away, you know, there's a whole different work at Humature you've got to do, uh, which is generally a referral to urologist for a few things. Okay, so that's always important to ask about. <coughs> Any boarding symptoms? Um, yeah, I suppose, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the retention, they're, they're not going to come to you in the SGP practicing, I'm in retention, you know, acute, I'm not going to acute pain for your retention, you're going to come to emergency department because they'll be busted, you're going to be a lot of pain. Okay. Um, obviously, other things in the past history you want to know about the you know fluid intake. I've been drinking a lot of coffee. You know, just this is just some guy having six tubbies every night and then you know waking up and going to the toilet ten times every night. That could be pretty normal if you have six beers every evening. Um, other things with fluid are things like diuretics. Do they have CCF? Any other fluid issues? Heart troubles? Do they have orthopnea? You know, all the kind of those kind of cardiac issues. If they take diuretics, they take diuretics is in the morning, is in the evening. Someone might be on a whack of fruzamide and you know every evening and they're waking up ten times at night to go to the toilet. All you have to do is change the fruzamide in the morning. You can make the symptoms a lot better. Can so potential um, constipation. Yep, yeah, absolutely. You should obviously have balance as well. Yeah, that's so you want to cover all that all the stuff. Um, um, on exam, what are you going to do? How do you, what kind of things are you going to do on examination? For this job? Yeah. Yep. Anything you would do? Simple stuff before that. <laughs> <laughs> I know you'd love doing that. So. <laughs> um, anything simple you can do before you subject him to that? Yeah, so, so examine the abdomen, papal bladder. Mainly, you're looking for a big bladder retention. You're trying to exclude, okay? Um, we can check the external genitalia. Some people just have retention because they have really bad phimosis and they're having a lot of trouble passing urine from a very tough phimosis. Look at the external genitalia, testes, all kind of stuff. You pick up, often pick up stuff. Um, and then, yes, the rectal exam, examine the prostate. Um, you're looking at firstly size, is it a big prostate? And then you also want to see if it's a malignant really thing prostate or a big prostate. Okay. Um, okay. Um, okay. Any okay. What investigations are you gonna do? Generally on this patient. Seventy two year old complaining with worsening labs, poor flow, having to wait up at night once or twice, going sort of every three, four hours from the day. Probably start with some basic blood so urine. Yeah. Um, specifically, a UEC looking at his renal function yeah. to make sure that hasn't gone off. Mm -hmm. um, you look at his urine to see if there's any kind of 
um, any infections or mm -hmm. any, any blood. Yeah. Um, and then you probably do, a, or you may do a PSA in combination with the DRE. Um, <clears throat> yeah, PSA is controversial. But when would you do a, firstly, you mentioned UECs. Why is it important to check for UECs in, uh, in patient urine works? Uh, I want to exclude uh, any insult to the kidney, so yeah, reflux yeah. nephropathy, or if there's a pilot arthritis yeah. associated yeah. with mainly or decompensation or of decompensation. the kidney. So normally, the first thing your body does is you get intrusal hypertrophy in, in response to a prostatic obstruction, the bladder gets thick, pushing hard, eventually can decompensate, and the pressure is transmitted from the kidney, from the bladder, up to the arrhythmia of the kidney, you can get hydronephrosis, you know, renal function, so yes, you see MSU, mainly a rule infection, and yes, if rule out hematuria as well. Um, and PSA, so when would you check PSA? If this guy was 83, 85, and you know, he's got 15 medical problems, would you check his PSA? It's almost a completely separate talk uh, in itself, it's PSA and prostate cancer, but you only check for PSA if you think prostate cancer is an issue for the gentleman. So if he's young and if he had prostate cancer, you would do something about it, then you would check his PSA. Otherwise, you wouldn't. That's not a, it's not a routine test for everyone who presents with this, okay? But in the right patient, yes. So generally young, with healthy patients, I like a PSA, okay? But you have to counsel them on PSA because once you start doing that, if it's high, it starts a string of investigations to remove the urology, and it's controversial. That's almost a separate topic. Probably can't go into right now because of time, uh, but that came up in my exam. So it could come up in your exam. PSA screening. It was surprising. I didn't think it would come up in a medical school exam, but it did. Um, the only prostate cancer issue would you do a PSA? Anything else? <clears throat> CT. Okay, do is or looking for I don't know strictures of the urethra. Would you see a stricture in a CT? KUV? No, I don't think ultrasound. In this case, you're not looking for stones, all you're looking for is hydrophoresis. You could do ultrasound. Ultrasound gives you good information because it gives you prostate volume. Uh, so it can tell you roughly how big the prostate is. It can give you a post void residual. So often, when they do ultrasound on the renal tract, they'll ask the patient, you know, they'll scan the bladder when it's full, then they'll ask the patient to go to the toilet, pass urine, and then they'll scan the bladder again to see how much is left behind. And that's a good indication of, you know, if they're living behind 20 mil, that's okay. If they're living behind 300 mils consistently, then you clearly know there is some problem. Okay, that's not a normal post void residual scan. So you can order some to look at prostate volume. And also, in the case of people who decompensate, have renal impairment, you can check hydronephrosis as well. Okay. You can measure the bill. <coughs> Yeah, you may not have that as a GP, but yes, um, we do that. Yeah, certainly, when they come to urologist, um, you call the uro uroflow metric. We basically ask them to have a full bladder, and we have a special toilet, and uh, they pee in that toilet, and we can actually there's this, there's a pressure sensor there that calculates what their flow is. Okay, um, what's what's normal flow? Roughly for you know for for you if you want the toilet, what would you pay? <laughs> Only about fifteen minutes per second or more. Okay. Right. Yeah, but yeah, you flow and you can measure the PBR with the latest scan. Okay. Um, so that's pretty much based on blood, urine, PSA if it's relevant, all the sound renal track. We give you some more information. Euroflow. Um, Okay, and that would be just that would be basic risk scans I would get in most people who present with less. Um, the other things is um, there's some objective ways to evaluate LUTs. So if I said you know, looking at storage symptoms, warning symptoms. There's also an IPSS questionnaire. So the 35, you can, you can get <clears throat> marks out of 35 for it, and that's an objective questionnaire that you can look to see how bad the LUTs are. So it's LUTs is all about what the patient is perceiving. Yeah. It's, it's yes, there are concrete indicators like renal impairment and hydronephrosis and retention that are medical endpoints, but in the end, it's all about patient. What, how, how much trouble are they having from their LUTs? So it's very important to get the, uh, an indication of what they think about their LUTs. Is it severe? Is it bothersome? And that's what the question is. Do they objectively quantify the bothersome 
nature of, of this last of that particular page. <coughs> um, and you can also do things like bladder bladder diaries, which basically you ask the patient to record how much they're drinking, how much their <coughs> urine they're passing for an entire 24 hour period. Okay, so things like um, storage LUTs where they're having frequency in Arcturia, those sort of stuff, you know, which can lead you down slightly different causes uh, than just BPH. You can use a bladder diary. Okay. So if they're passing urine, you know, every half an hour, small volumes. You know, it's slightly different to someone who's just passing urine for four hourly, but just with a very slow flow. Okay, so that can be useful as well. Now, <clears throat> if you come to urologist, um, certainly there's not something we do for every patient with LUTs, but if you think they have something else as a cause for LUTs beyond just their prostate symptoms, so people who've had urinary tract surgery might have strictures, uh, people who've had previous STDs, um, you know, can have strictures. If you think of bladder tumors, you know, there's like it's going to be blood in the urine, you can do a flexible cystoscopy. Okay? And it's just a camera examination of the urethra, prostate, and bladder. Uh, but it's not a routine exam, not even in a urologist. Not, I wouldn't do a flexi on everyone with this. Okay, it's just if I think they need that. <clears throat> Three, so initially, P setting, you've done, <clears throat> you've done an MSU, they had no infection. Uh, they're saying, oh, look, this is bothering me now. Um, you know, what, what are your treatment options? Say, say you think this is BPH, you feel the prostate, it's just a large prostate, it's benign feeling, PSA is normal, renal function is normal, they have no you know, red flags like hydrocephalus. <coughs> what are the treatment options for people with BPH? You know, for say, I suppose to start with non pharmacological, so modifying behavior, mm -hmm. avoiding certain, avoiding alcohol or yep. minimizing uh, and other diuretics, especially yep. before bedtime. Absolutely. Um, maybe uh, increase exercise. Um, yeah, it's always good. Always good. Always good. So, yes. um, <laughs> and then maybe pharmacological look at something like oxybutynin or um, yeah. or tamoxifen. Yeah, you start off with you know lifestyle factors, lifestyle, and then you have pharmacological therapy and then surgical treatment. Okay. Uh, lifestyle advice is exactly right. So like optimizing their fluid status if they're having too much coffee, stop that. If they're having too much alcohol, stop, you know, reduce that. Uh, some people want to say, oh, I want to have six beers at night and I don't care if I go to the toilet at night. You say, what's fine? It's fine. Mm -hmm. um, as long as you know, you're treating them. You know, just, yeah. So <clears throat> about optimized fluids, um, their diuretics, those sort of things, um, exercise, weight loss, again, yeah, always good. Okay. Um, pharmacological therapy. What, what pharmacological therapy did you have? Oh, sorry, tamoxifen. Um, yeah. Tamoxifen, an alpha blocker, or um, finasteride. Yeah. So rather than remembering the drug names, try and remember the classes of drugs because the drug DHA names will come and go. You know, if you ask AstraZeneca, they have one drug. Someone else has different drug. Try and remember the classes because in the exam, they don't want you to know trade names. They want you to know concepts or what are the classes of drugs you can use. <laughs> Ten years later, there might not be any tension. Yeah, I don't know. Um, so alpha blockers, um, and so the other ones are five alpha reductase inhibitors. Okay, it's things like finasteride, dutasteride, and there's combination therapy, which is a combination of both, which you can get, which you can get on Australia. Okay, um, <clears throat> that's called do it out. Okay, that's trade name. Okay, it's combination therapy. So. Generally, most people start off alpha blockers. You have alpha blockers that are selective um, for, you know, so tamsulosin is a selective alpha-1 um, blocker. So you have alpha-1, alpha-2, alpha-1, mainly a lot of them. The prostate are all alpha-1 um, and blood vessels, alpha-2. So things like prazosin is a non-selective alpha blocker. So if you give someone prednisone, you have to warn them about dizziness because it's a non-selective alpha blocker. It's going to cause hypotension by relaxing this with muscle in their in their peripheries. Okay. Um, Tamsulosin, on the other hand, is more selective. You can still get dizziness, but it's definitely more selective compared to a non-selective prednisone. So alpha blockers, selective, non-selective. Um, selective ones are better because they have less risk of partial hypotension, dizziness. Um, there's 
the way you think about it is there's two different ways that the, the main reason of pathophysiology of BPH is there's a dynamic component and there's a static component. The static component is actual, you know, hyperplasia of the prostatic glands. And then there is smooth muscle tone, which is the dynamic component. You always think about BPA as a static component, dynamic component. The alpha blockers are targeting the dynamic component because they're altering the tone of the smooth muscle in your um, in your prostate. Um, and the phytoreceptors inhibitors actually, what do they do? You know what phytoreceptors inhibitors do? How do they, how do they actually act in the blood? They reduce production of testosterone. Uh, no, the reduced production of dihydrotestosterone from testosterone. So your T goes to DHT, you have your testosterone goes to DHT in the final drug. Okay? And if you block this, then you're blocking the conversion of testosterone to DHT. And DHT is 10 times more potent than testosterone. Um, okay? and, and DHT is responsible for the hyperplasia of prostate. Okay? Um, or the BP. Um, so that's the static component. So it blocks conversion of your DHT, which means by, by, by nature it will reduce the size of your prostate because it's stopping the hyperplasia of the cells. Um, um, because it's okay. Things like that. Does it reduce the size or does it stop getting bigger? Uh, it will eventually because cells die, there's apoptosis and there's new cells coming up if you completely or if you largely block yeah. their proliferation, eventually the cells that will die and eventually the prostate will shrink. Do they feel like a decent reduction quite quickly? Yeah, yeah. Um, it can be, yeah. I mean, obviously it depends on different patients that have different trajectories, but yeah. you, can, you definitely can have sizable reduction, especially over a long period of time, two, three years of therapy, you can have significant reduction in prostate size, absolutely. Okay, but generally, these hyperactive inhibitors, as you know, this is a male, male hormone that plays a significant role in sexual function. So you can have a lot of different side effects from blocking DHT, okay, so loss of libido, erectile dysfunction, um, you know, lack of energy. So you've got to warn them of all that stuff. Okay, so you're not going to start this drug in a 53 year old person who's sexually active unless there are specific indications or unless you warn them specifically about side effects. Okay, alpha blockers. And if you're using non-selective ones or even whatever you use, always warn about dizziness, partial hypotension. Um, and combination therapy. So do you know when you would use so all? Most GPs will start off with alpha blocker. Um, um, do you know in what setting is there evidence to use use five correctors inhibitors? When would you use them? Obviously, in people who accept a lot of side effects, yes. Is there any particular prostate volume below which they don't have any benefit? Because really, they're reducing the size of the prostate. They're not dealing with the dynamic component, they're dealing with the static component of your BPH. So, anything above 40 cc prostate volume, there's good evidence that combination therapy or addition of PAP product as two alpha blockers will, is beneficial. Okay, below that, not very much. You're probably better off with yourself. Okay. Less a side effects and really no benefit. And sorry, what tests would you be ordering to actually engage the size of your patient's prostate? Yes, ultrasound. So one is clinical exam and for an objective measure. So you can just ultrasound so will give you prostatic volume. You can go up to down. <coughs> it depends on how experienced you are, how many you've done. But yeah. Okay. Yeah. Rough. People are wrong, but. You can tell if it's huge, moderate, small, at least. Okay. Um, um, and there's other things that you mentioned, things like oxybutynin. So that's really more for the story of symptoms. Okay, because ox ox oxybutynin is anticholinergic. So uh, it's going to stop, you know, often people who get obstruction, they develop secondary changes. Like we said, we get intrusive hypertrophy. One of the things you can get as a compensation to obstruction is overactive bladder. And that's why you use oxybutynin, and you often use it in combination. So use alpha blocker. If they're getting a lot of erectile bladder symptoms, you add on oxybutynin or anticholinergic. What are the anticholinergic side effects? So, so, so what would you want in a vibe for oxybutynin? A dry mouth, dry eyes, yeah. constipation, urinary retention. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Okay. So if they have a post residual residual of 300 mils, you're not going to put them on oxybutynin because you can't put them in retention. Okay. Um, so again, very important to know what side effects, common side effects of common drugs. Okay. Um, confusion's other one. 
especially in older men, if you give them anticholinergics, they can get very good news. So don't give it to someone who gets a lot of, you know, 85 year old man looking up the right now. Trying to avoid anticholinergics. Um, um, so that's pharmacological treatment. There's others as well, but this is the most common one. Okay. Um, surgical treatment. I mean, there's, yeah, there's tons. There's so many, like, you know, I could spend two hours talking about them, but most common one is TRP, okay? And there's various, like, there's various, they can use lasers, you can use, um, you know, water jets, you name it. There's any technology that exists that has been tried for loss, okay? But the most common one is a TERP. Um, what are the indications for surgical management of loss? What would you say? I'm not going to give you medications, you need an operation. So just like there was indications for admission for kidney stones, there's specific indications for surgery in lungs. Which is which is acute urinary retention. So pain for urinary retention. Uh, yeah, just need one episode of acute urinary Yeah, so that's again so often often so we'll go into that next. So acute urinary retention, that's one. I'll speak about that. Not everyone retention goes go straight from tab, of course. Um, what else? So we talked about decompensation. So anyone with hydronephrosis, renal impairment, you're not going to try alpha block it. Okay, they need to because their kidneys are at risk. Uh, they need operation. They need a different manage. Any complications of obstruction like? Kidneys, uh, like bladder stones, recurrent urinary tract infections. You generally go straight from surgery. Um, okay, acute retention, acute retention, high pressure retention with renal impairment, um, and complications of uh, this is bladder stone and recurrent infections. Um, uh, what else? What was the indication? So management of urinary retention. Not everyone with the retention goes straight for TERP. So if someone comes to you in ED saying, "Oh, I haven't passed a bowel action in four days," there's, there's different things you need to find out about. You know, what could they have retention? Do they have pre-existing urinary tract symptoms? Are there any precipitants of retention? So what can put you in retention? Just about anything, like drugs, pain, <coughs> medications. Constipation, um, surgery, you know, like tons of things can put you in retention. If you're just generally unwell, um, that's enough to put you in retention. Your um, infection infections. So if they have a clear precipitant, then you would put a catheter in, obviously, for retention, and then try and deal with that precipitant. So if they're constipated, you get the balance going, they have infection, treat the infection, and then you can try to them in. Couple of a week or two, or once the precipitant has been alleviated. Okay, um, but if it's someone who's you know has no clear precipitant, has ongoing low direct symptoms that have been worsening with time, retention, then you know it's probably from BPH. You can still trial avoid them um, with uh, we put them in alpha blocker. You can trial avoid them, um, but if they fail that, then you to try it. okay. But certainly. Very reasonable to trial the word once, as long as you have no signs of decompensation, like normal renal function, no hydronephrosis, okay. And if they fail the trial the word on an alpha blocker, then they go for surgery. Okay, give their fifth breath. Any other questions? We just um, I don't know if we're going to get to a this immaterial. Yeah, um, I can go through it quickly in five minutes. Yes, yeah, at least I can you know, tell you, you know, what sort of management things yeah, sure. we should have. Since you've asked, why don't you start? <laughs> um, what would you do if someone someone comes to you? Firstly, you don't know what what are the just the critical points in history you want, and what are the investigations you normally do? There's not a lot of examination in hematuria, the same thing, you know, DRE, external genitalia, make sure they're not retention, that not. But mainly, there's a few things in history you must find out, and then there's certain investigations that you must do. Okay, um, so my strong suit, but um, 
and the symmetry of the time course for me would be important. So, like if it's um, just that the chronic thing has been ongoing or acute, it's associated with well, it's pain, so it's associated with pain. Um, uh, <coughs> for me, my I've just been taught for any symmetry of the bladder cancer. Um, yeah, so just like you have PR bleeding is bowel cancer and peripheral wise, you mature as bladder cancer or urothelial cancer until peripheral wise. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, okay. Not sure what else I would ask. So, just the general urological history, like we talked about for lads, but there's two things you have to ask. So, risk factors for urothelial carcinoma, which is basically what you're trying to exclude with anyone with hematuria, or the two main risk factors. Okay. Yeah, that's number one. And radiation Yeah, that's one. I mean, more that's down the line, the two most common ones are the exposure to industrial, um, so aniline dyes, so mainly rubber factories and textiles and those sort of things. Um, you can see even, even a lot of people who work you know, with mechanics and those sort of things. Um, okay, but classically talking about aniline dyes, which is rubber factories and textiles. Okay, those are two most occupational risk factors. Smoking. Okay, two most important ones you must be asking about. <coughs> Investigations. MSU. MSU, related infection. Yeah. You want to know where the red blood cells are coming from, whether it's a glomerulonephritis uh, yeah. or whether it's a yeah. uh, lower urinary tract. Anything else? You want to know about that renal function as well. Yeah, the routine bloods. Yeah. I guess you're less reasonably suspicious of asymmetry of blood systems. Yeah, absolutely. Cystoscopy. Yeah. So everyone should have cystoscopy of their hematuria. Um, <clears throat> Stoscopy only tells you about the bladder, but what about the kidneys? They could be bleeding from a big renal mass, or big urethral cancer of mine, their renal pelvis. Are you going to include that? Yeah, CTIVP. This is different to CTKV, which is talking about the stones. CTIVP is with contrast and a delayed phase. So we're looking at excretion of contrast into the ureters. Okay. And you classically see them as filling defects in the renal pelvis of the ureters. Um, and there's another urine test you can do, which is urine cytology. That's where that, okay. So often it's positive only in high grade. It's, not, it's a very specific test. It's not a very sensitive test. So if it's positive, that means something is definitely wrong. You get cancer. It's negative. Okay. So MSU cytology, cystoscopy, um, and CT. Okay. Now of course you tailor it all to the patient. You know, if someone's 99 and you know. High level care, you may not do everything with this, but generally, this is what you would do for someone with hematuria. Okay. And once you would find it, you would do. Okay, if, what if they have clot retention? They came they came to ED, it's out. got hematuria, passing huge clots, now I can't pee anymore. So we'll call it clot retention. It's not urinary retention like we talked about before, this is just retention from so many clots in your bladder that you can't pass urine. What do you do for that? What kind of catheter? So if you have urine retention, what kind of catheter do you put in? There's two kinds of catheters. It's two-way catheter, three-way catheter. Two-way catheter is to decompress the bladder, and you go home. Typically in men, you put 16 francs, women 14 francs. With uh, immature clot retention, you need to do a three-way catheter. Okay? So they have an extra port where you can push things in. Um, Three-way being one is out port, one is the balloon port, like a two-way catheter, that's an extra in. Okay, and the reason it's useful is the bigger balls, and you can do a manual washout. So you can take a catheter dip syringe and actually wash the entire bladder down. Okay, um, which is what you need to do in some clot retention. Put a three-way catheter in, do a good manual washout, um, and if you're around maybe I can show you some time. Very different. Okay. Any questions?